Uh, today's message I have entitled Caramel Apples and Jelly Beans. Bear with me, I think this will make some sense here in just a minute. Whenever I was growing up in the youth group, uh, we would do an annual hayride, and we quite often, uh, you know, we would get together, we'd have a bonfire, we'd roast hot dogs and all that kind of stuff. We'd hop on the hay trailer, we'd take off and go for a nice little hayride. We'd come back to the bonfire, we'd roast marshmallows, we'd play games, we'd have a devotion and things like that. And that was just like a regular occurrence we would do every year. One year, the game that we had was a caramel apple eating contest. Um, and I was not a contestant. Um, for one, I'm weird and don't necessarily like apples unless, okay, I'm picky. If you take the skin off first, I'm cool with that, but I just, I don't like the skin on the apple. But anyway, uh, so the contestants were chosen, and everybody was handed a caramel apple. So they thought. One of those contestants was lucky enough to have a caramel onion, <laughs> not an apple. And I, I thought it was quite hilarious because I was not one of the contestants. And had I been and taken a bite of that caramel onion, I probably would have lost my hot dogs that I had earlier. Um, but I will admit, years later, whenever I became a youth pastor, I thought, you know what? That was a pretty fun game. <laughs> I think we need to do this. And so I, too, following in the, the steps of my youth pastor, uh, I did this game. And so the students, they all thought that they were having a caramel apple eating contest, one of which was a caramel onion. I thought it was funny. Um, shortly after that, we went into a lesson that was talking about how things are not always what they seem. Well, a few years ago, Jelly Belly, which is a jelly bean company, they came out with this game, I guess you can call, call it. It's called Bean Boozled. Anybody out there play Bean Boozled? It's a wonderful game, wonderful game. The way it works is pretty simple. The game comes with a little spinner card, and you spin this arrow, and wherever it stops, it tells you what jelly bean to eat. Well, there's a catch. That jelly bean, even though it looks identical, could be a good jelly bean, or it could be a bad jelly bean. For example, there was one that was either going to be birthday cake or taste like dirty dishwater. There's one that's either a toasted marshmallow or a stink bug, uh, buttered popcorn or a rotten egg, cappuccino or liver and onions. There was actually one, I don't remember what the good flavor was, but it tasted like vomit. And let's just say that chemists nowadays are very, very good at what they do. Um, you know how sometimes when you throw up, you have that little acid little sitting in the back of your throat? <laughs> that jelly bean will do that to you. It's quite wonderful, quite wonderful. Actually, I, I played that game here once with our students. And I had one kid that literally took half the box and ate them all at the same time and never made a face. I'm like, that kid has no taste buds or something is messed up with him. Um, probably a little bit of both. But the, the caramel apple and the jelly beans both appeared good on the outside, but on the inside, they weren't so much. They were not what they appeared to be. Today we're going to be in Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 20, and this comes from the end of Jesus' message uh, that we refer to as the Sermon on the Mount. It's probably a familiar passage for most of us, um, and it's really kind of a self-explanatory passage, but then we're going to take a little bit of time to kind of dig into the application. Let's, so let's pray before we dig into this. Father, thank you for today. Lord, thank you for what you do for us. Thank you for allowing us the freedom to be able to come here to worship you with one another, with other brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, I thank you that we have the truth of your word, Lord, that you have given to us so that we can know who you are, know what you stand for, know what you expect from us. And Father, I thank you that your word promises us that when two or three are gathered in your name, you are there with them. So Lord, I thank you for you being here with us this morning. Lord, I pray that you would speak through me. Lord, I pray that you would open my mouth if it's your words and that you would shut my mouth if it's mine. Lord, may your name be glorified. It's in your name we pray. Amen. 
So Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 20, it says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. So the first thing that we see here is a warning. Jesus says to beware. Anytime that we see the word beware, it's kind of a little hint that we need to pay attention, that he's getting ready to tell us what's going on, that there is danger that is close. And so he goes on to say, beware. Label, warning labels are there for a reason. Did you guys know that? Warning labels are there for a reason. Has anybody ever read the bottle of pop, like a 20-ounce or a 2-liter bottle of pop? Anybody ever read a warning on there? There's a warning on there, and it reads something like this. Contents under pressure. Cap may blow off, causing eye or other serious injury. Point away from face and people, especially while opening. Anybody here ever lose an eye opening a bottle of pop? I haven't either. Um, but evidently, people have been injured doing that, or else they wouldn't have that warning on there. Uh, did you know that there is a baby, or there's a warning on some baby strollers that says, remove child before folding? <laughs> I just want to know what dumb parent tried to, I don't know. Anyway, or how about some of your coffee cups that says, warning, contents may be hot. You remember a few years ago when McDonald's got sued because they gave somebody ordered a hot coffee, they gave them a hot coffee, and they put it in their lap, and then it spilled and burned them, and they sued, and they won, so therefore you have warning, hot coffee on your coffee cup. Um, I, I would think that you would know it was hot. Of course, nowadays, we, lots of people drink an iced coffee, but if you order a hot coffee, you should know it's going to be hot. Um, years ago, supposedly, there was a warning on snapper push mowers. It said, warning, do not pick up and use as hedge trimmers. Somebody probably lost some fingers trying that one. So the warnings are there. They sound dumb, but they're there for a reason. They are there to protect us, right? So Jesus is warning the listeners. He says, beware, warning, there's danger. You need to be aware of this. And he doesn't leave them hanging very long. He tells them what to be aware of. He says, there's false prophets. And so who were these false prophets? Well, theologians say that there's three possibilities. It was either Jewish opponents or Christian opponents, or most likely, it was really not a specific group of false prophets. It was just a simple warning saying that, hey, false prophets are going to come. You need to be aware of this. The specific who doesn't really matter. What matters is that last one. False prophets are going to come, and we need to be aware of them. Jesus says that they come in sheep's clothing. Their outward appearance is harmless. They look the part. They might even act the part. On the surface, they can be very, very convincing. But he goes on to say, but they are wolves. How many of you are dog people? Dog lovers? How many of you are crazy cat lovers? There's a few crazy cat lovers in here. Okay, I'm sorry, cats are evil. Um, <laughs> just saying... I still love you with the love of Christ, but uh, I don't agree with your animal choice. But dogs are cute and cuddly, all right? And so you think of a wolf. Well, a wolf is of a dog kind, and so f from appearance, they're cute and cuddly. Anybody ever seen a wolf? I think they're cute and cuddly, all right? And some people have even domesticated them and, and had them as pets. Um, but here's the thing. If you find a wolf in the wild you probably should not go try to teach it to sit and beg and roll over and that kind of thing. It's probably going to try to rip your face off, okay? They look harmless on the outside, but they're dangerous. Think back to the caramel onion and the jelly beans. They look good, but they're not. So if they look the part and they act the part, how do we tell the difference between true prophets and false prophets? And Jesus says you give them a test. You examine their fruits. All right, whenever I was in school, one of my 
least favorite things to do was take exams. Um, okay, any crazy people who like to take tests? We have one in here. Blade, why am I not surprised that you like taking tests? I'm, I do not like taking tests. And really, I'm not a very good test taker. Um, but truthfully, I could sit through class and I could bluff my way through the conversation, through the discussion. I, I could appear to know what we're talking about until we took the test. And then that would show my knowledge, or most often m the lack thereof my knowledge of the subject. But there was one class that I had in school that I, I really liked this class, actually. It was chemistry. It was my senior year in my chemistry class. My uh, counselors probably need their head examined for allowing me to take chemistry, uh, but I loved that class. You know, we would always do some sort of test. And towards the end of the year, our, um, our chemistry teacher, he gave us this series of tests that he had called unknowns. But before I go there, I'll tell you something about chemistry class I did one time. I know it's not very smart, but we're talking about me. I took hydrochloric acid because I was curious and stuck it on one of my fingertips because I wanted to see what it would do. <laughs> did you know that your fingers will smoke? <laughs> Luckily, I washed it off and did no damage, and the teacher still does not know I did that unless for some reason he goes back and listens to this message today. Then he'll say, well, I'm not surprised it was Tyson. Um, but anyway, it was the end of the school year, and so we were having our series of tests that were called unknowns. The way the unknowns would work is our teacher would give us a test tube, and in this test tube was a chemical. We didn't know what this chemical was. And so we had to run a bunch of different tests on this chemical to determine what it was. One of my favorite tests um, was a flame test, and because different chemicals would put off different colors of flames, and believe it or not, I actually did pretty good on those tests. Actually, in chemistry, for me, this is, okay, this is pretty good, okay? I pulled off a pretty high B in chemistry. Um, that, that's good for me, okay? Uh, usually, most of my classes were Cs. Um, I had a very, very wrong mentality in school, and that was if I did not try and I got Cs and C was average, I'm okay with average. Until I got later on in where I was taking college classes for ministry and I had to ac actually pay to take my classes, I was not okay with average anymore. Um, to tell you the truth, I ended up with a 3.75 um, GPA from OBU after like 60 or 70 hours worth of classes. And the only reason why I did not have a 4.0 was because of Greek. Um, it's not a very easy class. That phrase, it's all Greek to me, no longer funny when you take Greek. <laughs> just, just so you know. But anyway, I actually did pretty good in chemistry class. So Jesus told his followers to examine, to put to the test what people are saying. You're going to know them by their fruits. Put them to the test. Hydrochloric acid, it might look similar to water. I would not encourage you to drink it, just, just so you know. Jesus goes on to say, grapes don't come from thorn bushes. Figs don't come from thistles. Good trees don't produce bad fruit. Bad trees don't produce good fruit. A false prophet may say some things that sound truthful. They might even mix a little truth in with what they're saying. If you remember back to the Garden of Eden, the serpent tried this. Now, I've also used this analogy many times, but have you ever read the label on rat poisoning? I know it sounds like I go around reading labels. I really don't. Uh, I had heard this one taught to me, and it's one of those things that stuck in my head. Ever, anybody ever read the rat poisoning label? 99% good stuff. Less than 1% is poison. But what happens if you eat that? It's going to kill you, right? So even though a false prophet, a false teacher might mix in some good stuff, it's still dangerous. Stay away from it. If any part of what someone teaches cannot be confirmed in Scripture and in the proper context, it's bad fruit. And that's very, very important, proper context. It's very easy to find a Scripture that's going to back your beliefs. Very easy to do that. But when you keep it in context, you can't do that. So make sure that what they're teaching lines up with Scripture, but it also is in the proper context of the Scripture. So what happens if something fails the test? Well, a failed test, Jesus says to throw them in the fire. Okay, when a fruit tree is not producing good fruit, it's practically useless. It's basically only good for firewood 
But let's clear this up. Jesus is not saying that we have the authority to take false prophets and throw them in a fire, okay? Don't try that. You'll end up in jail. But this was a foreshadowing. Jesus was foreshadowing this is their fate. This is their fate. Eventually, they're going to end up in the eternal fire of hell. And to tell you the truth, that's our fate too, unless we turn from sin and turn towards Christ. And so he's, he's given them the warning, this is their fate. They're, they're useless, they're going to be thrown into the fire. So when a prophet is proven to be false, we should not listen to them. That's that simple, that simple. When I first got into the ministry, golly, it was just over 20 years ago now, um, there was a famous speaker back then, and I'm not going to say his name, but he was a famous speak speaker, and he had a phenomenal series of videos. Some of the best teaching videos I've ever seen. Just wonderful. He had this way of communicating the deep, deep truths of Scripture in a way that anybody could understand, but they also did not, did not lose their depth when he taught them. A few years later, though, for whatever reason, that guy kind of lost his mind. Um, he started teaching a lot of stuff that was not true. He started teaching that there's no such thing as hell, uh, that hell is the bad things that we experience here on earth. That is hell. That everybody, when they die, goes to heaven. Because after all, God is a God of love, and love wins, so everyone goes to heaven. Such a false teaching. Uh, whenever I first came on staff here, they were actually using those videos here with the youth group. And back then, that was fine. Uh, like I said, these were phenomenal videos, and I should throw them away. I actually still have a few of these. I haven't looked at them in years, but I will not use them anymore. And the reason why I can't use them anymore is because, in my mind, part of my job as a pastor is to help protect, to help protect our people that God has placed uh, in our lives to, to give instruction to. And so my fear is if I was to use these videos now, because the guy is very good at what he does, it would be very easy for people to say, you know what, I like his teaching, and then go start listening to that guy. Maybe even read some of his books. And that is a very, very dangerous thing. So I stay away from those things. And to tell you the truth, it breaks my heart. Like I said, this guy was good. But I sit back now and I think, how many people have been led astray because of this guy? How many people are now on the pathway to hell because of this guy? thinking that they're, they're okay. And that, that's a scary, scary thought. It totally breaks my heart. And to tell you the truth, it's not fun sometimes being in a role to where we have to sometimes protect people. You know, quite often um, I, I've heard people say stuff that was not false or, or follow things, or you know, say stuff that's false or follow things that are false. And when you have to correct people on that, it's not fun. It's not fun. We have to be very, very careful with how we do that. Um, this one has got me in trouble a few times. Uh, there's a popular book out now that's called Heaven is for Real. They even made a movie about it. And I'm going to tell you that title is true. Heaven is for real, but that book's not. It's not. If you read that book or watch that movie and you look at Scripture, you're going to find that it does not match Scripture. And so from the outside, it has the appearance that it's a good thing. But when you dig into it, you find out that it's not. It's not a good thing at all. It does not line up with Scripture. So it has the appearance of being good fruit, but it's actually bad fruit. There's also uh, a teaching that is quite popular, that when our loved ones die, they become our guardian angels. And I can't say how many times I've heard that taught by people who are believers, who whenever they have a child that has a loved one die, they say, you know what, but they're your guardian angel now. They're watching over you. And I've gotten trouble from parents for teaching this before, but you know what? That teaching does not line up with Scripture. That is a false teaching. It's a dangerous teaching. And to tell you the truth, I don't want my loved ones to be my guardian angel for multiple reasons. I don't necessarily want them to see how dumb I really am, even though they probably already knew that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love you too, TJ. Um, yes. But here's the truth. If you really study that, you will find out that if a person became an angel, that would actually be a demotion, not a promotion. 
It's actually a step backwards whenever you read scripture. So people teach that. It's not true. It's, it's a false teaching. It's a dangerous teaching. Please, please don't teach that. And if any of that, what I just said, made you mad, I'm sorry. But at the same time, I'm not sorry because it's the truth. Come talk with me afterwards or whatever. That's, that's fine. So how does this apply to us? In present times, we are being exposed more than ever to false teachings. Our children are being taught evolution in school. To tell you the truth, evolution versus creation is one of my favorite subjects. I love this. Um, I got into it whenever I first came on staff here uh, because I had one of my students say, hey, where do dinosaurs fit in the Bible? And I'm like, you know what? I should know this, but I don't. And so I started researching that. Did you know that the Bible talks about dinosaurs? Yeah, it does. Dinosaurs are mentioned in the Bible, but it does not call them dinosaurs because that word was not invented yet. Okay? You see Leviathan, you see Behemoth, you see, um, golly, um, there was another one. Anyway, they're mentioned in there. Um, And this is just free. This is not in my notes. This popped in my head. If you read the King James translation, you will actually see that the Bible talks about unicorns. Unicorns are real but they're not horses with a little horn on their head. When you go back to the Latin, it's unicornus and binocornus. And so you have the one-horned or the two-horned unicorn, but those are rhinoceroses. So kids, I'm sorry, I just ruined your um, stuff there. Um, Your next party, when you want to have a unicorn for your party, um, it's going to be a little bit bigger than you thought it was. (laughs) Just, Just saying. But there's a lot of false teaching out there Years ago, uh, not years ago, just a couple of years ago, TJ and I both were members of a social media group called Youth Pastors Only. And the premise of this group was that it was a bunch of youth pastors from all over the world that would just encourage one another, pour into one another. Um, and that's, that's a great thing. But we were continually seeing so much false teaching on there. This guy a while ago that I told you that's lost his mind and said there's no such thing as hell, There was a bunch of people just always promoting him, saying how good he was and how much they loved him and how much they're teaching this to their students and all this other kind of stuff. And there was stuff on there that was worse than that, and you weren't allowed to correct them. If you tried to correct them, you'd end up getting banned um, from that site. So we both just ended up leaving it. But that breaks my heart because how many people are out there who are Christians who are teaching false information to people? It breaks my heart. So I know for us, it might be easy to somewhat want to dismiss this message message and say it doesn't apply to me. I, I, I know what the Bible says. But truthfully, like I said, I've been in the ministry just over 20 years now. Do you know how many people in the last 20 years who claim to be believers have shared with me their beliefs that do not match up with Scripture? I know believers who claim that homosexuality is not a sin. Abortion is not a sin. Sex outside of marriage is not a sin. Getting drunk or high is not a sin. Cheating on your taxes is not a sin. They believe these things because they have been taught these things from people claiming to be pastors or teachers or theologians. I have friends who say that homosexuality is not a sin, and they'll give you scripture. To back it up, again, context, very important, context, because they have to take it out of context to do that. They have to twist the scripture to make it say that, because let me tell you, it does not say that, okay? It says the exact opposite of that. I've read articles from Christian authors that were written in a way to excuse their sins by twisting scripture. Just so you know, if you use scripture in a way that's out of context to make your sin okay, that in and of itself is a sin. Years ago, and I know this will be hard to believe because I don't like being in front of people. I've said that before. This is not my comfort zone. But years ago, um, before I was actually in the ministry, actually when I was first starting out in the ministry too, so it started before I was in the ministry, then continued a little bit. uh, Some friends and I, we had a skit group and we would travel around to different churches, and we would do skits. And one of the skits that we did was called the Red Balloon Skit. And the premise of this skit was pretty easy. 
you would have one person walk out on stage and they'd have a red balloon in their hand and they'd be like, oh, this is a pretty red balloon. I love my red balloon. It's a beautiful red balloon. It's my favorite red balloon I've ever had. And they're playing with the red balloon. Somebody else walks out on stage and they're like, man, that is a just an amazing green balloon. They're like, what do you mean? This balloon is red. Well, you can think it's red if you want to, but the truth is, I went to college, and, and my professors, when I took philosophy class or whatever, they taught me that whatever I think is what's real, so I think that's green, so that's a green balloon. And it goes on through a couple of different things like that, different people coming out calling it different colors. And each time in between, the person would be like, it's, it's a red balloon. And then the way that skit would end is the person would look at their balloon, and they'd say, you know what, the funny thing about truth is, it's true whether you believe it or not. And that was just kind of the idea of the whole skit. Scripture is true whether you believe it or not. Amen. No matter how much you twist it to make it say something else, it does not make it true. The truth is what Scripture says in its proper context. In Matthew 24, in verse 11, Jesus says, Many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And he continues on in verse 24, it says, For false Christ and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Some false teachers are more obvious than others. Some of you will remember this more than me. Uh, there was a guy named Jim Jones several years ago. Through his teaching, he had 900 plus followers who all committed mass suicide together. Just a few years ago, I say a few years ago, I think it was back in the 90s, there was a man named Marshall Applewhite uh, he was the leader of a cult called the Heaven's Gate. 30 plus people committed mass suicide under his teachings. And you know what his teaching was? Hey, there's this comet coming. It's the Hellbob Comet. And behind this comet in the tail, you can't see it, but there's a UFO. And this UFO, if we kill ourselves, we will be taken up into this UFO and taken to heaven. At least 30 people believed him. And they killed themselves in order to do that. Those are obvious. At least, I hope those are obvious to us. But some are not so obvious. You know, there's a lot of churches that teach, and this could get me in trouble, I don't care. Um, <laughs> it's the truth. There's a lot of churches that teach something that is called, that we often refer to as the prosperity gospel. And this teaches that financial blessings and physical well-being are always God's will. It's always God's will. This means that if you're a believer and you're not rich, it's because you're not doing something right. You don't have enough faith. There was a famous pastor just a few weeks ago. He's from Tulsa, and I'm not going to tell you his name. But he was from Tulsa, and he posted this video on social media. And he says, do you believe in the poverty gospel or the prosperity gospel? I'm going to stop right there for a second. There's one gospel. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's not a poverty gospel. There's not a prosperity gospel. There is the gospel. That's it. Should have stopped right there. But he goes on to say, when you think about money, it should mean more purpose. God wants you to live a blessed life. More money does not mean you are more blessed. Less money does not mean you are less, less blessed. Matter of fact, no amount of money determines your blessing or lack thereof, okay? We're blessed when we're believers because we have the Holy Spirit with us. Amen. But God does expect you and me, whether rich or poor, to use what we have to honor him, Amen. period. Use what we have to honor him. This one actually kind of made me mad uh, years ago. I had a customer whenever I worked at Radio Shack um, he came in, and at this time, my grandmother was really sick, and she was in the hospital, and I was expecting a phone call from my mom to give me an update, and so I was with this customer, and my cell phone rang, and I saw it was my mom, and so I knew it was going to be an update, and so I asked the gentleman, I said, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I said, my grandmother, she's really sick, she's in the hospital, I'm expecting this phone call for an update, can I just step away and take this call for a minute? He said, absolutely, go ahead. So I take the call. And I get off the phone, and the first thing he says to me is, you know what? If you have enough faith, she'll live. I hope he saw the disgust in my face. 
but I didn't say anything to him. I, I, I didn't, real, I said, little thing. I just said, you know what, that's not how it works. And I, that's not how I believe. And I just left it at that because I did not want to get into an argument. But that implies that if she would have died at the time, she didn't, she lived for a few more years. But that implies that if she would have died at that time, it would have been something that we did or didn't do. That's not how God works. That's a false teaching. And to tell you the truth, that comes out of the prosperity gospel. Remember, he wants you to have financial blessings and physical well-being. That is always God's will, but it's not. There's a famous mega church. They're really known for their music, and to tell you the truth, they have some songs that are good that are on the radio, and they have some that are bad <laughs> um, that shouldn't be. But a few years ago, their worship leader, they had a child die in the middle of the night. I think this child was like three years old. The child died unexpectedly. And so this church, this worship pastor, they had a three-day worship service, three straight days, begging God to bring her back from the dead. Now let's be clear. We know that in Scripture God has done that. He did that with Lazarus. God is still in the miracle business. God still does miracles. But what their, their belief there, that was tied back to the prosperity gospel. And I, I haven't seen any interviews. I don't know what that worship leader thought at the end of those three days and their child didn't come back to life. But can you imagine being taught that if it didn't happen, it's because of your lack of faith? And that's a false teaching. It's not from Scripture. Not from Scripture at all. Healing always comes to believers. Wait, that's against what you just said. Let me tell you this. Healing always comes to believers. It's not always the way we want. I didn't think I was going to get joked up. But, uh. When we are a believer, if God chose to heal us here physically on earth, eventually we're still going to die one day. But we, when we are in his presence, we are 100%, 100% healed. So healing always comes for the believer. <coughs> There's a, makes me think of another um, specific group, and I'm not going to name this church either, um, but they're very well known for going door to door. You can narrow it down between the two, okay? Um, they use their own translation of Scripture to teach that there is no such thing as hell. They teach that only 144,000 people are going to heaven. And if you're good enough, even though you won't make it to heaven, you might just make it to paradise earth. That's totally taking Scripture out of context, and it only lines up if you use their translation of Scripture, which, by the way, I have a copy in my office um, just because I'm weird like that. Um, but that is such a false teaching. And, and I used to work with three people from this belief. And so I asked one of them one time, I'm like, okay, so you're not one of the 144,000. They said, no, we know we're not. Those have already been determined. I'm like, all right. So your hopes are to get to paradise earth if you're good enough. Yes. What happens if you're not good enough? Well, we're annihilated. What do you mean by that? We just simply don't exist anymore. I said, so you, no hell, no nothing, just simply cease existing? They said, yeah, and I said, I want this religion because I can go live however I want to live. I can do anything I want to do in, li in life, no consequences, because when I die, I just simply cease existing. So that's not what the Bible teaches. That is not true. And you know, it might sound like that's kind of a unique teaching, but it's not. There's another teaching that comes from that, that another denomination that teaches that or another religion i guess you can say that teaches that but i also have a friend of mine who is a southern baptist pastor and i've actually had him speak for me at youth events before and we've had him at retreats for us and things like that and phenomenal speaker 150 million times better than me in speaking which does not take much but anyway he's a lot better he's one of the best communicators i've heard and just he has a way to put things in such a way that it's easy to understand. But now, lately, he has started teaching 
annihilationism. And I asked him about it one time on, on social media. I sent him a private message. I'm like, man, how can you, how can you believe this? And he has a podcast that you can listen to, and I just haven't made myself listen to it yet. And he says, well, go listen to this episode of my podcast, and I explain from Scripture how I got to there. Very dangerous. Very dangerous. Now, I'll tell you, this is one of the many reasons why here at Lake Center we believe in what we call expositional preaching, book by book chapter by chapter, verse by verse. It doesn't mean we go by books all in order, but you can't, when you teach that way, it's a lot harder to take something out of context. It's a lot harder to make Scripture say something that it doesn't say. And so that's why we do that. It's not the only way. It's not that people can't teach um, topical, but it's so much harder to take things out of context when you go expositionally. So what do we do? How do we know if what we believe is true or not? There was a group of theologians in the Bible that were called the Bereans. And in Acts chapter 17, verse 11, it's talking about the Bereans. And it says, Now the Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Say that fast. Uh, they received the word with eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Paul and Silas were on a missionary journey. They go to Berea, and they're sharing with them the gospel. And the Bereans said, good story. Now let's go check that against Scripture to make sure what you're teaching us is correct. That's what we should do. Anything that we are being taught in church or by anybody has to be tested against Scripture, including what I'm teaching you today, including what you just heard in your small groups, including what you hear from Caleb every week. Anything that we teach, anything that we say, needs to be tested against Scripture. Period. And to tell you the truth, that's kind of scary. Do you know that the Bible says, and this is not, this, not my notes either, it's just a freebie, but do you know that the Bible says those who teach the Word are going to be held to a higher standard? I guarantee you I am never going to knowingly teach you something that's false. I guarantee you, Caleb is never going to teach you something that he knows is false. None of our small group Sunday school teachers are going to teach you anything that they know is false. But I'm also going to tell you this. I'm human. I've made mistakes before. There's been times where I believed something that I thought was true from Scripture, to where whenever I studied later on and found out it wasn't true, or maybe had somebody come to me in love and say, hey, you said this the other day, but here's why it's false, and took me back to Scripture in context and showed me why it was false. I'll tell you what, I'm glad that I have friends like that. But you know what happens, or what should happen when that happens in our life, whenever we realize that something that we we're believing is not lining up with Scripture, or somebody shows us that what we believe was not lining up with Scripture, you know what should happen? We should change what we believe. It's that simple. See, there's people out there that will just ignore that Scripture passage, or they're going to twist it. But whenever we realize that maybe there's something that we have believed that wasn't lining up with Scripture, we have to change what we believe to match up with Scripture no matter how difficult it might be, no matter what it does for your entire belief system, you have to change to match up with Scripture. I've used this analogy several times. The Secret Service is the branch of the government who really um, is responsible for the counterfeit stuff. You know how they know the difference between counterfeit money and real money? They study the real deal. They study the real deal. There's way too many fakes out there to be studying, so they study the real deal. And then whenever they see a fake, they know it's a fake because they know the real deal. They know the real money so well that they, they know it's obvious that's fake. It does not match up with this. As believers, we have to study the Word of God. We have to. That's how we're going to know the difference between a true and a false teaching, a true and a false prophet. Does it line up with Scripture? 
And if you're not sure, the answer is in Scripture. It has to line up with Scripture. And you know what? It's not just the pastor's job to teach you these things. You have to be in the Word on a daily basis or a regular basis. I'm not going to say you have to do daily. Yes, daily is best. But on a regular basis, at least five times a week, on a regular basis, spend time in the Word of God. It's your own responsibility, too. If you have questions about it, then yes, you come to somebody else. You come to a Sunday school teacher, to a pastor, to an elder, to a deacon. You know, I've had students over the years that have asked me questions about stuff. And I've had to say, you know what, I don't know that answer. But I'm going to study and I'm going to find it. Whenever I do, I'm going to come back and I'm going to tell you. I had one student I had to keep apologizing to for like three months. I'm like, I'm still looking. I'm still, I, I promise you, I'm still looking. And then one day it hit me um, what they answered. And I, I don't even remember what their question was. I just remember it took that long. And so I, I called them like three months later and I'm like, hey, you know, three months ago you asked me this. And they're like, yeah. I said, here's what scripture says about that. Here's, here's the truth behind that because of what scripture says. The truth can always be found in scripture. It is a tool that God has provided us that we will know the difference between truth and lies when it comes to the teachings about him, when it comes to the gospel, when it comes to the things of Christ. We're not perfect. We're going to make mistakes. When we realize those mistakes, we have to change our beliefs to line up with scripture. And as long as we still have breath in our lungs, there is time to do this. So in closing, I want us to keep these things in mind. TJ, it'll be a second. So you, I know that you hear in closing, you're like, oh, time to go. Uh, and we have to keep these things in mind. Does who you are listening to teach the Bible in context? Do your beliefs match up with Scripture? In today's passage, Jesus says you will know them by their fruits. Test what others teach you against Scripture. And if what you are taught or what you believe does not line up with Scripture, change it. It's bad fruit. Stay away from it. But if it does line up with Scripture, that's good fruit. Hold on to that. Hold on to that. Sometimes we have to do a self-test. How is your fruit? The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, when you are in Christ, you are a new creation. The old has died and the new has come. A new creation is going to display the fruits of the Spirit. In Galatians 5, 22 through 23 says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Does your life reflect these fruits? If not, you have to ask yourself a question, why not? Is it because you've simply have lost your focus? Maybe you've started thinking about other things or you've taken your focus off of Christ or is it because maybe you don't have the Holy Spirit because you don't have a relationship with Christ? You have not repented of your sins. You have not turned from your sins and turned towards God. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not going to display these fruits. Yes, it's possible to have an appearance of these fruits, but you're not going to have these true fruits if you don't have the Holy Spirit in you. If you have lost focus today, it's the time you can make that right. Even right now as I'm talking, just in your, in your heart, you can just say, God, I've lost my focus. Help me to turn my focus back to you. Lord, I know that the answers are in you. Lord, I know you're where I need to get my answers from. Lord, I know your word is what teaches the truth. Lord, help me to get my focus back. You can do that right where you sit, right in your heart. If it's because you don't have the Holy Spirit, if it's because you have not turned from your sins and turned towards Christ, I would love to have a conversation with you about that. TJ would love to have a conversation with you about that. Our deacons and elders, your Sunday school teachers, would love to have a conversation with you about that and tell you how you can have that security, how you can know you have this relationship with Christ. So if you want to know more about this, come see me after the service. Come grab one of our deacons and elders after the service. If you don't feel comfortable doing that, I understand. It's hard sometimes for you to, uh, to want to talk to us like that. I understand. So I'm going to give you another option, okay? Give you a couple more options. In your bulletin, there's a little tear-off thing on there. And so you can just simply mark on there, put your name, put a contact phone number, or however you would prefer us to contact you and say, hey, I want to know more about salvation, or I want to know more about whatever that you have questions about. Fill that out. 
put that in the offering plate and we'll get in contact with you and we'll schedule a time to sit down with you and to have these conversations with you. If you're like me and you like technology, most of the chairs now, all the chairs that have the um, pockets on the back of them, you see three different stickers there now. Um, and so if you know what those QR codes are, use one. Um, one of them says information, uh, one of them says prayer, and one of them says visitor. The one that says information, if you have questions, do that one and fill out that form electronically on your phone. It's going to send us an email and let us know that you want to communicate with us. You want to have a conversation with us. So please do that. Let's pray and then we're going to sing. Father, I thank you for the truth of your word. I thank you for being a God who loves us so much that you give us the truth of your word so that we can know when something is true, when something's false. Lord, the truth is you love us. The truth is you sent your son to die in our place so that we would not go to hell, that you have sent him to pay that price so that when we turn from our sins and turn towards him, we can have eternity in heaven with you. Lord, that's the truth of your word. Lord, the truth of your word is that you love us that much. So Lord, I thank you. So Lord, help us to hold on to this truth and help us to proclaim this truth to others. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen.